How's it going, everyone? We're back for another AP Gov video, the final Gov video that I'm going to do to help you guys prepare for the AP Gov cramming at the last minute. And in this video, I'm going to go over all nine required documents as fast as I possibly can so that you guys can get the main ideas for writing that argumentative essay. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into the video. We're talking about those nine foundational documents. Now again, you've got to have, you don't need to memorize quotes from these nine documents, but you should understand the basic ideas behind these nine documents and have those ideas memorized. So the main idea from each of these nine documents is what I'm actually going to go over, no quotes at all, but you should know everything that I go over in this video for the AP exam tomorrow to help you write that argumentative essay. So without further ado, let's get right into the video. All right, so first we're going to take a look at the Declaration of Independence, the first document you can take a look at, and there are three big ideas that you should take away from it. Well, first of all, all three of these ideas are based on the foundations of democracy. So you should understand that the three foundations of democracy are found in this document. They are natural rights, nat not natural rights, natural rights, popular sovereignty, and the social contract. So natural rights, the idea that we are born with rights bestowed to us by God, and therefore they cannot be infringed upon us by the government, the idea of popular sovereignty, popular means people, sovereignty means power, so power to the people, that the people have the power in government, in a democracy, and the idea of the social contract, this idea that um, this found the Declaration of Independence, it's the idea that we basically give up our power to govern to a government and official, and we do that, we sign a contract saying, hey, we're giving up some of our power to you so that you can govern us, and in exchange, you're going to make sure that you do not infringe upon our natural rights. Take that away for the Declaration of Independence. Next up, we talk about the Articles of Confederation, and this was the first constitution we had for the first 11 years of our democracy, um, for our time as, uh, that was our first 11 years of government, and we were coming off of a monarchy, so we wanted, because we were coming off of a monarchy, we really didn't want a very strong central government. So the central government was very weak, and the states were very sovereign and super strong. Each state had one vote in Congress, and the big ideas you should take away from the Articles of Confederation is that Congress couldn't tax. If Congress wanted if the central government wanted tax revenue, they were going to have to knock on the door of the states and ask the states for um, to give them some tax revenue. And I'm sure you could probably guess what happened when that happened. The other thing is that there was no executive or judicial branch under the Articles of Confederation. And the other big thing is it was really hard to manage an army under the Articles of Confederation. This became very evident during Shays' Rebellion. Now, you don't have to understand this is not a push. So you don't have to know necessarily what Shays' Rebellion is. But what you should understand is that basically what happened is a bunch of farmers uprised and then they went to, and then the they, they were like, all right, well, let's get a military to come in and just put this rebellion down. And there wasn't one. And so the elite members of the democracy, so the more educated, higher class citizens, realized that these kinds of rebellions could happen at any time if they didn't change the government system. And so that showed off another weakness in the Art Articles of Confederation. So couldn't tax, couldn't maintain an army very well, and no executive or judicial branch. Those are the key things you should take away from the Articles of Confederation. Next up, we're going to talk about the Constitution. Now, I don't really want to talk about the Constitution a ton. You should go review the Constitution on your own because it's such a big idea. Um, but you should understand that it establishes a limited government, and it's exactly how it sounds. It's the government, but limited. You should also understand that it establishes a separation of powers. It establishes checks and balances. It basically establishes a Republican government, and it has a lot of federalism, this idea of national power over state power and delegating power between the national government and the state government. Um, definitely go on your own to review the Constitution because you got to know all your amendments, you got to know the articles, you got to know the Bill of Rights. So make sure you know all of that for the AP test. Next up, we got the Federalist Papers. So we're going to talk about Federalist number 10 first off. So Federalist number 10, um, basically uh, Madison was arguing about this idea of factions and that factions are going to be the biggest threat facing the new nation. Uh, but we can't get rid of factions because they're natural. We're, we're never going to be... It, the, their causes cannot be removed. And um, you, if you destroy factions, you actually destroy liberty. So instead of... we can't. In order to m control factions, we rather have to limit their negative effects. So we control factions by limiting their negative effects. So if we have a large republic, that large republic is going to be the best way to protect those factions and protect the minority rights while maintaining majority rule. So basically, if you have a large um, republic, you'll be able to um, limit the negative effects of factions. Know that for Federalist 10. Um, basically, Madison is arguing for a pluralist democracy in Federalist number 10. 
In Federalist number 10, Madison is arguing for checks and balances and the sep and separation of powers in this new government. Here, a quote from Federalist number 51 says that if men were angels, no government would be necessary. You must first enable the government to control the governed and oblige it to control itself. So Madison's basically arguing that we need a government because people aren't perfect, and but because people aren't perfect and we need a government, we also need to limit that government because the people in that government also aren't perfect. So basically he's arguing for checks and balances and the separation of powers. Another quote that goes along with that is, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. So if you remember anything from Federalist 51, remember checks and balances and the separation of powers. In Federalist number 70, Hamilton is arguing for in favor of a unitary executive. He, he argues that a good government is going to need an active and, and um, a decisive executive, and that if you have a weak leader, a weak, weak executive head of the nation, it's going to lead to an inefficient government. Um, and he argued that a single president was going to be more effective than dividing up the, the executives into a bunch of different smaller powers and a bunch of different smaller groups. Um, and that he also argued that the executive branch has to act more quickly than Congress. And an interesting argument that Hamilton brings up in terms of arguing in favor of a unitary executive is that if you have one single member in the executive branch, it's actually easier to assign blame and hold the president more accountable, right? If you have a parliamentary system like Britain does, there's multiple people in parliament, and they can easily point fingers at each other and be like, no, you did it. And then they can be like, no, I'm going to pass the blame to this person. It's really easy to pass the blame in a parliamentary system because there's multiple people in that parliamentary system. Whereas if it's just a one-man person, if it's just relying on the president, then if the president messes up, he cannot shift the blame to anyone else. He has to take that blame. And so what, he's, what Hamilton is arguing is that if you have... Only one person in the executive branch, one singular president, it makes that per that president more accountable to the people and to the public opinion. So if you remember from Federalist number 70, he is in, Hamilton is in favor of one unitary executive. Remember that for Federalist number 70. In Federalist number 78, Hamilton is arguing for life terms for federal judges. And he's also trying to establish judicial review in the judiciary branch. So he's basically, uh, let's first talk about the idea of judicial review. That's the idea that, uh, remember from Marbury versus Madison, judicial review is the idea that you can deem laws unconstitutional. The, ju the, 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 the Supreme Court has the power to declare laws unconstitutional. That's the idea of judicial review. And Hamilton is arguing that the judicial branch should have the power to do that, and that is a check on Congress. Um, he also argues that there should be life terms for federal judges, but he also argues that those need to be those cannot be elected by the people. Now, you can probably understand where that argument uh, that where that might come to a fault, because if those people are staying in for life and they're being elected by a certain small number of people at the top, specifically the president, so almost an elite democracy in that kind of sense, and that they cannot be removed, they have to be there for life. The people don't really want that. They don't understand how that's a democracy, how that fits in the constitution. But Hamilton is arguing that, hey, this is okay because the judicial branch is going to be the least dangerous branch in the government, right? Because all they can do is deem if laws are unconstitutional or if they're not unconstitutional. They can't, uh, they can't like, make legislation to force their decisions to be made that way. And they can't, they can't force people to follow their decisions. All they can do is simply make decisions on whether laws are constitutional or unconstitutional. So that's what you should take away from Federalist number 78, is that you should take away that Hamilton is arguing for life terms for federal judges and um, an independent judiciary that can engage in judicial review. Next up, we're going to talk about Brutus One. Now, in Brutus One, Brutus um, is a part of the Anti-Federalist Papers, and so they're arguing against the establishment of a constitution. Now, he argues that once people give up their power to the government, once they have that social contract where they give up their power to the government, uh, Brutus argues that they cannot get that power back ever again. Um, and he argues that the, um, the elastic clause of the United States Constitution, he argues specifically against the elastic clause of the U.S. Constitution. He claims that the federal government's, um, it'll give the federal government absolute and uncontrollable power. Um, 
And then, so basically he's arguing against the ratification of the Constitution, and he'd rather have power be held by people in smaller, more local governments and would like it to be more democratic. So since he wants power to be in a ton of little local government groups, he therefore wants a pluralist democracy where a bunch of groups um, govern. Um, so he's arguing for a pluralist democracy against the Constitution. He believes that if the Constitution gets ratified, it's actually not going to be a pluralist democracy, but it's actually going to be more of an elitist democracy. Now, finally, we have the letter from a Birmingham jail, and that's kind of a complicated uh, document because a lot everyone's like, okay, well, these are all, all the other documents are 18th century documents, so why is there a random 20th century document thrown in with a bunch of 18th, 18th century documents? And for the AP exam, um, it's best to be interpreted, and I would recommend you interpret it this way for when it comes up on the AP exam, is that it's demanding the fulfillment of of other foundational documents, so it's like demanding the f fulfillment of the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution, specifically around the 14th Amendment, but it's applying it to all people and applying it to um, desegregation and civil rights and making sure that African Americans have those rights in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution as well um, as well as everyone else, so that blacks have equal rights, just like established in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So you can find a lot of parallels to other required documents. Um, in the um, Declaration of Independence, or sorry, in the letter from Birmingham Jail, a lot of the ideas presented in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are also in a letter from Birmingham Jail. So whatever you take away, the thing you should take away from the letter of Birmingham Jail is it can be interpreted as demanding the fulfillment of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, but demanding it for all races, all genders, for all people, for all people to be equal. All right, guys, that is all the foundational documents you need for the AP exam. Now, again, you're going to have to use those foundational documents. They'll probably be referenced in the multiple choice section of the AP exam, and they will most definitely be referenced in the argumentative essay, that fourth AP response question in the AP exam. So make sure you understand all of these foundational documents. It's the last video I'm going to do for AP Gov for you guys to cram for the AP exam. Uh, make sure you know these nine foundational documents, and make sure you go review your Supreme Court cases as well. Um, with that being said, that's all I've got for you guys. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys. Good luck on the AP U.S. government exam tomorrow morning.